Hi James, I think I was quite happy with take four, but I'm just going to take five here because I have the time. You're not here yet, so I'm just going to, just, just for the sake of it. So going from here. This is the part of the video series where I generally pick my favorite mini. But on this occasion, that might be a bit of a challenge. Hello and welcome to The Lucky Roll, an eclectic channel for eclectic games and today we're going to be doing issues 81 to 90 and the final episode of the Warhammer Imperium magazine from Hachette collection. Um, originally the series was supposed to end at issue 80 but it was so popular that they decided to extend it another 10 issues. So the first three of the new issues came with three different Paragon war suits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the three issues then I'm going to show you the three different Paragon war suits at the end rather than do it one at a time. So looking at issue 81 we have here of course this is what you're getting the Paragon war suits and you have three different ones. So the Sisters of Battle finally make a comeback with the start of the new extended issues. We have um, a new story which is set on a place called Celeria, which is basically to do with Slanesh, uh, the god of passions, excess and lust, and it has a little bit of aspect here with the Emperor's children and in particular the Noise Marine. So there's a little story there. You have the How to Build Guide for the first of the Paragon War Suits. You have the How to Paint Guide for the first of the Paragon War Suits. And of course you have here the stats for the same. Um, it also comes into what's called Campaign 2. Now you might be wondering why is Campaign 2 here uh, instead of Campaign 1 because Campaign 1 is in a later issue. But it of course uses um, the new minis that you're getting and you have different campaign markers. Issue 82 of course comes with the second of the three Paragon War suits and it comes into what's called a new war zone which is Obelus and Lilac and phase three of the same. You also get a little bit of information on the Aldari and their specific craft worlds. You have a very interesting story called War of Faith which basically has zealots on both sides. So you have the Sisters of Battle on one side and the word bearers which would be the chaos equivalent on the other. So quite an interesting little story this one. You have the how to build guide, you have um, the how to paint guide for the second one. Now these do come with variant builds so you can kind of arm them with a mace or a sword depending on what you wish. And the third campaign here is the Battle of Tragus and of course here you also have an out, uh, a little additional insert which is campaign one which is the mission pack for the latest issues. And finally we have here 83 which is the last of the Paragon War Suits which has the Paragon Superior so she would be the leader of the Paragon War Suits at the section leader. So it starts off with the Warzone, Obelos and Lilac phase four. Um, it goes a little bit more to the Eldari with their mythology. And you have, of course, a short story with the actual Aldari. So that's a, a kind of a nice little way to end off that new little bit of information. You have the how to build guide, of course, for the Paragon Superior and how to paint the Paragon Superior. And of course, it comes here as well into campaign four. So despite being an issue three, you actually have four little campaigns for these issues. So let's check out the actual models themselves. So. These are the Paragon War Suits and although they look amazing and stand out in the battlefield really well, they are very flimsy to put together. I actually had quite a hard time putting these together and I'm glad they came in three separate issues because it gave me time to work on them. Um, very bitty, very fiddly, but nevertheless very impressive looking. I mean, these are gorgeous kind of war suits. So this is the one that you get in issue 81. This is the one that you get in issue 82. And as you can see, you do have various armaments. So I have a bolter here and a heavy bolter, and you have a sword and a mace. So of course, this sister of battle has her helm on. So she's obviously concerned about not being headshot, but, um, they are, again, very impressive looking things. And this, of course, is the Paragon Superior, whose rank, of course, can be denoted by her 
symbol here on her chest and her kind of her red eye and also the fact that she has I think a flamer here along with a more elaborate sword type than the previous model. So um, she of course is the section leader of the Paragon War Suits and were like I said fun to build but uh, I'm glad it was spread out over three issues because they were quite bitty and I have to be honest I don't know if I would ever supplement the force unless they were extremely useful because um, it verged the the hobby time in this verged from a little bit from a chore to a joy joy certainly when I had them all done and dusted but a bit of a chore because they were difficult to put together regardless that was issues 81 to 83. Issue 84 comes with the Skitari Field Marshal uh, a singular mini but nevertheless he is basically uh, a field commander so He's someone that would be leading your Skatari forces on the field, and he has some very interesting kit with him, including a control stave, a servo skull, enhanced bionics, and a radium serpentia, which basically fires irradiated ammunition. So he's uh, he's he's not out there uh, unarmed or undefended by any means. He can hold his ground. Um, it comes into the lore, adds onto the Eldari, so it gives you some more information on them, and a very interesting little story with the mechanic and the Tyranids, which uh, given that 10th um, edition is just around the corner, is a, a nice little appetite whetter for uh, what's coming. Um, you also have the how to build guide for the Skatari Marshal and how to paint guide for the Skatari Marshal. It also gives you some Adeptus Mechanicus rules and Warlord traits, given that you now have a effective Warlord here. Um, you have the Skatari Marshal stats and the data sheet, and you have the fifth campaign, which is Thyphos Besieged. Now, as for the Mini himself, um, it was quite enjoyable building this because after the uh, Paragon War Suits, it was nice to build something that was straightforward and simple and, you know, easy to put together. I quite enjoyed going back to the Skitari. They do take a bit of time because you need lots of different layers to get the right colors, but uh, nevertheless, the details... There's a lot of details, but because there's a lot of details, it's easy to pick them out and it's easy to make the model look good. So again, I went for the uh, Martian Iron Crust to kind of fill out the base, given that he is a Martian. But the Skitari Martial now was something I did quite enjoy putting together. And uh, like I said, after the Tree Paragon War Suits, he was almost like a holiday in that he was just straightforward, easy and... Um, a fun issue to build after the uh, after my little penance with the sisters. Issue 85 comes with the Hexmark Destroyer, which is a tripedal Necron sharpshooter. So if uh, 40k ever had, I suppose, the Western Gunslinger, this fella would be it. Basically, he has five arms all covered with weapons so he's um, basically he's a fire support group all on his own um, a very interesting little mini i'm currently playing him in the mobile game titanicus and he is a beast he just shoots all around him so to have him on the actual tabletop is great um, it also goes into some lore, so you have some more information on Space Marine heroes, heroes. So you have Ezekiel, who'll be a Grand Master of Librarians with the Dark Angels. You also have Samael, which is a Grand Master of the Raven Wing. Um, it goes into some more information about the Tyranids and the invasion that's coming there. So again, nice little information to whet your appetite for 10th edition. Um, it goes into some information about the Alderi again, and it also has a nice little story that's based on, um, or that's akin to the Kill Team uh, box set that came out not so long ago with the Necrons and the Karskin Imperial Guard. So just if you wanted to kind of uh, enjoy your box set a little bit more, there's a nice little story there on it. You have the how to build guide for the Hexmark Destroyer and how to paint guide for the Hexmark Destroyer. You have, of course, the stat sheets and you have a new campaign mission, which is six called Kajalama's Skull. So let's have a look at the actual mini itself. Um, now, I actually, I honestly thought he'd be a little bit bigger. Uh, so he's kind of, I thought he'd be the same size of a Scorpic Destroyer, but he's actually a tiny little bit smaller. But as you can see, he's guns up the wazoo. I mean, he's, there's six weapons here. So, I mean, he is literally the 
craziest gunslinger in the 40k west so as you can see you have a weapon here you have a weapon here and you have a weapon here and that's only the weapons on his right hand side here on the left you have a weapon here a weapon here and a weapon here and he has of course spider eyes so i suppose he can see he can dedicate one eye to each weapon depending on where he wants to shoot it um I thought he was going to be a complicated build because he's very spindly but the instructions are actually very well laid out and if you just do it one arm or one limb at a time he comes together quite nicely um, for something that looks like a complicated build he was actually quite straightforward and quite simple um, a nice little mini but like I said I thought I thought he'd be bigger but uh, nevertheless, uh, a cool little mini and certainly someone can put down heavy fire and hold his own in any uh, gunfight. So that is the Hexmark Destroyer. Now, issue 86, 87 and 88 are a three-part issue with the Redemptor Dreadnought. So what I'll do is I'll do the three issues in a row and then we'll look at the Dreadnought at the end. Um, the other good thing about having three issues in a row like this is of course you get a very big impressive mini, but you also get an awful lot of extra lore. So regardless, we'll start of course, the it starts off with the Redemptor Dreadnought, what sort of gear he has, what he does. Um, it also goes into some, hero, some of the heroes now, Astroth, the Grim is a member of the Blood Angels chapter. Uh, he's basically the High Chaplain, or he's, he's got the rank of Redeemer of the Lost. Um, the Blood Angels are very interesting in the sense that they're susceptible to something called the Black Rage. Um, basically, a mad battle lust that pushes them beyond reason. Um, they, it leads them to massive feats of heroism, but uh, at the end of it, their mind is so gone that they normally die of their wounds and for the few that don't die of their wounds um, and are still out there roaming the Astarath the Grim goes out and gives them the Emperor's mercy by killing them so uh, not a pleasant job but obviously a very important one um, you also have Lamartes which is Guardian of the Lost so Lamartis was a basically he's a chaplain that helps the Blood Angels and uh, despite being someone there to kind of guide them is no less susceptible to the Black Rage himself but it is unique that he was taken by the Black Rage um, but when the previous hero uh, Astarath came to deliver the mercy he found that despite being in the midst of the Black Rage he still remained cognizant and reasonable so he put him on stasis and uh, basically kept him alive now the chaplain is the one who leads the death company so blood angel warriors that are close to death or close to the black rage are kind of put into the death company which is kind of a, a suicide squad and chaplain lamartes is the one that leads them um katachan is one of the more famous imperial worlds because it's the it's a death world and it's home to the jungle fighters so some of the imperium's best uh, soldiers come from this place including sly marbo which is uh just worth googling on your own uh he is it is absurd how powerful that character is um they're essentially they're jungle fighters and they were very inspired by the arnold schwarzenegger in the predator movie but uh, nevertheless they're a very cool faction all of their own you have some more information on the tyranids um you have some information here on the flesh terrors who are uh how do I put it? The Blood Angels uh, get angry. These guys get even angrier and are even more susceptible to the Black Rage than many of the others. Um, you have here information as well. The Devastation of Baal, which was when the High Fleet Leviathan came upon the Northern Reaches. And you have here a very interesting story uh, on the Catechin death world called Green Hell. So, of course, it's the orcs against the Catechin jungle fighters. And a, a good little story, quite a nice one. And, of course, you have some of the more famous images. So, as you can see here, it is very kind of jungle warfare, Vietnam, Arnold Schwarzenegger, predator type uh, inspiration to these things. But, nevertheless, pretty cool. Um, you have, of course, the stats of the Redemptor Dreadnought, and you have the campaign mission, which is Megaria. And that is the issue of 86. Now, issue 87 would be the second part of the Redemptor Dreadnought, but it goes into even more lore because it has room to give it to you. And what it focuses on is the Sabbath worlds. 
Now, in particular, the Sabbath worlds are a crusade made famous by um, Gaunt's ghosts and Colonel Commissar Gaunt. And um, I have a particular graw, which is the Irish word for love for these stories, because it's written by one of my favorite authors, a man called Dan Abnett who um, not only writes novels, but he also wrote a whole load of stories for a comic book collection that I've collected since I was a child called 2000 AD. Um, he's a very famous character such as Sinister Dexter. Um, a whole heap of incredible work behind this author. But uh, one of his favorites, of course, are Gaunt's Ghosts, which have a huge story. And what these are also particularly uh, resonate with me because um, they're very Celtic based. Uh, they would be kind of, a, if there was Irish people or Celtic people in the 40k universe, it would be the Gaunt's ghosts. Um, Dan Abnett himself said that their accent is a mixture of Irish, Welsh and Scottish. And the Tanith regimental pipes here, of course, are akin to um, what we would call illin pipes, which are elbow pipes, or as you've got the more famous Scottish one, the typical bagpipes. But there is a very kind of Celtic Irish element here and obviously I'm naturally biased because I see my own representation in these uh, figures but they're exceptionally well written because Dan Abnett himself is an exceptional writer. Uh, another three books that Dan Abnett have written that if you are interested in the lore of 40k is the first three books of the Horus Heresy and uh, I believe he's the man that's going to be finishing off the Horus Heresy as well. An exceptional writer, so for me it was a particular thrill to see Gaunt's Ghosts get their own little five minutes in this Imperium magazine. Um, you have some lore here on the Chaos Command and the Blood Pact. You have Fulminators, which would be um, basically an offshoot of the Ultramarines. You also have the Howling Griffins, again another kind of offshoot of the Ultramarines. Um, some more faction focus on the Tyranids. And you have a very interesting little story here on uh, a Chaos Chosen. So uh, basically a lot of Chaos Champions, if they're depraved enough, survive uh, long enough, they can become Chosen and can kind of ascend to demonhood or become even more demonic. So it's a kind of a, it's a promise from the Chaos Gods that if you are horrible enough for long enough for them that they will do that for you. You have the How to Build Guide here for the Redemptor Dreadnought, which is... Um, it's straightforward enough, but it does give you a lot of options. Um, so I'll let you have a look at it yourself for the options, because I did deviate from the standard with this mini, as you will see when I get to it. Um, you also have the campaign trail here, which is uh, Defending Glantia. And of course, we have the final of the three issues, which I think came with the base for it, um, has some more Space Marine heroes, so you have Arjack Rockfist, who is the Admiral of Fenris and is a member of the Space Wolves. You have Harold Deathwolf, again, another Lord of the actual Wolfkin. You have Tyranids, so there's more in more interesting information again on the Tyranids. Um, you also have Phase 5 of the Obolus and Lyrek uh, Warzone. And you have a nice little story here on um, the Redemptor Dreadnoughts. What makes the Redemptor Dreadnoughts interesting is that it normally houses a very badly wounded space marine that will never fight again but whose combat experience and um, veterancy is too valuable to lose so they put him in a redemptor or a venerable dreadnought and he continues to fight so it um, kind of hammers home the whole only in death does duty end so even if there's only a few bits of you left uh, the Space Marines, if you can fight, will make you fight. Um, so it's a very interesting little story on the Redemptor Dreadnought. Um, you have Warzone here, which is the faction of Terra. So as you can see here, you have the Imperial Palace and the sprawl going out from it. Um, you have the How to Paint Redemptor Dreadnought. So it goes into a few little touches here because the magazine assumes that you're quite good at it at this stage. And you have Campaign 9, which is the War on Dejala. So let's have a look at the actual mini itself. Now, like I said, I deviated from it a little bit uh, because I had already built a Redemptor Dreadnought before. He was kind of very classical pose, stompy. This guy, I wanted him in a kind of an action pose. So the way it was coming, it's kind of like he was being pushed to the side. So the Tyranid is just something I added. And of course, the skulls and bits and pieces are just something I added. But with the way the legs were working out for me, it was basically he was spinning and reacting. 
to something. So I kind of like the idea that I was able to pose him into kind of a, a caught in battle moment. So these minis are actually quite good in the sense that there's enough leeway here in the limbs that'll allow you to do so. Um, there's also a little bit of leeway here in the legs that'll allow you to do so. So I, as you can see, I was able to kind of curve him and curl him around to do it. Um, I didn't have the Tyranid at the start, but uh, basically because I was trying to turn him around and he was ending up in this pose, it just seemed natural to me to kind of rob one of my friend's Tyranids. So uh, again, Jack, thank you for letting me rob this poor little guy and sacrifice him for the greater good. Uh, Jack will get that because he's a tower player. Um, so it was just something I thought was fun to try with one of my Redemptor Dreadnoughts and to kind of give an action pose. Now, of course, if he's going to be fighting Orcs or if he's going to be fighting Eldari, it's going to look a bit strange that there's a, a lone Tyranid in the middle of the battle, but I'm sure my opponent will actually forgive me. But the Redemptor Dreadnought was a great little piece to work on. And uh, because of the leeway in the design and how brilliantly uh, Games Workshop have designed this model, it allowed me to kind of uh, do something a little bit different for it and kind of scratch that little hobby itch of mine. So absolutely, uh, the Redemptor Dreadnought is definitely a crowning piece in the Warhammer Imperium collection. Now issue 89 um, came with a figure I hadn't heard of, but it's actually very interesting and it is Lord Inquisitor Draxus. Now, um, she is unique among the Inquisitors, or not unique, but she certainly deviates from your standard Inquisitor in the sense that she is not beyond using the weapons of the enemy against them or uh, using the old mantra, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Inquisitors can often be Puritans, but uh, sometimes the Inquisitor Xenos will um, use uh, Xenos techs, tech or uh, Xenos agents to help fight their causes and um, Inquisitor Draxus is one in particular who does that. Now she's a big she, she's a big opponent of the Necrons which is probably why she has an Aldari weapon and she of course has a familiar called Shang which is a psychic creature which is bonded with her. Um, it also has some interesting information here on um, Orgvar, Orgvar Sorry, forgive my pronunciation, but it's um, it's a war zone which focuses on the leagues of Votan. So it's uh, it's nice to have a little bit of lore here in this magazine. So I, it, especially since the leagues of Votan, I think came out after Warhammer Imperium was launched. So it's good that with these ten, extra ten issues, they're able to touch on them. Um, you have, of course, here a story about Lord Inquisitor Draxus, which is a nice, interesting, long little story and kind of justifies the lovely little mini you've just gotten. Um, it has a how to build section and, of course, a how to paint section. And it, of course, has her data sheet here. So she has a few interesting little rules and she's also a psyker. So uh, quite, an, quite a cool little character. Um, there's a little tutorial on how to use her in terms of uh, using grenades and to dominate. And the mission is called a Vide Battle, where, of course, she's facing off against some of the Necrons. So I have her here, and she was an interesting uh, mini to paint because I had never heard of the character before. But uh, thanks to Warhammer Imperium, I was able to read up on her a little bit. Um, a very interesting little character. As you can see, she has a kind of a Xenos skull here. You have the uh, familiar here at the side. Now, I tried to use the contrast paint for him to uh, what I thought was kind of limited success. I'm not a big fan of the contrast paints because even though it does make the work quite quick, it, uh, it can be a bit random in the way it does. So, unfortunately, I do honestly think I could have done a better job with her. But uh, nevertheless, she was a cool little mini, something that I would never have in my collection if it wasn't for Warhammer Imperium. But uh, if it's someone who does appeal to you, it's a very interesting little issue. And if you wanted to kind of give a gift to the Imperium player who has everything, I'd say she's a cool little mini that you could kind of get to add to their collection that um, I'd say would be a fairly safe bet that they do not have. So again, a cool little Inquisitor and uh, something I might try and see if I can fit into um, a customized version of Kill Team Ashes of Fire. Issue 90, which is the 
last issue for uh, Warhammer Imperium, so it's kind of a, a bittersweet issue to uh, read and finish. Comes with Illuminar Cesaris. So, um, because he's a beautiful, fantastic looking model, you don't get quite the same amount of lore in this issue, but you do get a lot of information on him and how to kind of build and paint him. So, as you can see, he's an epic model that is siphoning some poor uh, human's soul right out of their head. Uh, he has, of course, his battle record here, and you have the how to build guide here. So there is a bit to building him, but uh, despite that, it is worth the build, but I would be very careful in snipping him out because there's a lot of tiny little pieces that uh, you want to kind of snip out carefully. You have a how to paint guide, which of course is fairly elaborate because not only are you painting Cesaris, you're also painting a kind of a humanoid figure that's being kind of um, destroyed. But you also have, of course, all the paints that you've collected up to this point. So you can go into quite nice little detail on it. Um, so of course here you have the final gallery and you have the data sheet for Illuminar Cesaris himself. And you have of course uh, one tiny little tutorial just on the Illuminator himself. And the final campaign which is the assault on the pylon. And that of course as you can see here is congratulations you have completed the Warhammer 40k Imperium collection. But there is one little bit here in the foreword from Ian, which he says, hopefully this is just the start of your Warhammer 40k journey. And for those of you who are watching, I also hope that is the case because it is quite the hobby. And this is, despite all 90 issues of Warhammer Imperium, is still only a taste of all the goodness that is there in Games Workshop's uh, 40k range. Now, as you can see, it is a very elaborate model and a lovely thing to kind of finish it with. Now, as you can see here, he is literally siphoning the soul out of this guy. Uh, and he has a kind of a finger here, which is twirling it. So it is a very beautiful little set piece. And he's a very kind of intimidating model, which I thought would be difficult to put together. But again, Games Workshop did an excellent job in designing this. So uh, it's a very step-by-step -step instruction, um, but it, uh, it does come together very nicely. I would be very careful, especially in clipping this bit out because that is very frail. And um, I would also certainly very slowly build him because he is an epic model that deserves a lot of time. I mean, he comes with some very elaborate bases here as well. So, I mean, this is definitely a kind of a centerpiece model for your Necron army. Um, but uh, all I can say really is it looks amazing. And it was quite the model to finish the entire collection on. Uh, speaking of which, I still have to choose my favorite model from the issues. So. Bear with me one second, please. This is the part of the video series where I generally pick my favorite mini, but on this occasion, that might be a bit of a challenge. Everything you see here is what you get in the magazine. And uh, even at that, I don't have enough room on my table to show absolutely everything that we have. There's still some terrain here tucked away in the corner. Um, this, my friends, is the culmination of over a year and a half's work, over 90 issues. Um, as you can see, you have all the Necrons here, you have the Ultramarines here, you have the Sisters of Battle here, and the smittering of Skatari here, including all the terrain that you get there in the background. Um, it's been quite the journey. Uh, it's been a great project to kind of pursue and do because it trying to get these videos out uh, gave me an impetus to ensure that I stayed on top of the collection and to ensure that I stayed on top of my painting and to put aside hobby time every week which has actually coincidentally been quite good for me as a person because hobby time is always time that you take for yourself and allows you to kind of work away life's stresses by fixating on something that's fun. Um, in terms of picking a mini, that would be very difficult because there's so many wonderful little things here uh, on offer with this magazine series. Uh, one in particular is uh, this. Um, 
this was the fourth time I was painting this particular terrain and I was actually quite sick of painting it. But there was a paint guide in the magazine which uh, showed you how to do this kind of rusted, dilapidated, water damaged effect. And it uh, turned something that was what I had perceived as a chore, the fourth kind of one of these um, terrain pieces to paint into something that was fun and that kind of grew me as a painter because I got to try something new and completely different and was quite quick. So this piece was uh, a highlight of the collection for me just in terms of that the paint guide with this collection was so good that it kind of encouraged me and got me to do that. Um, other really fun little pieces of course would have been this character with the Skitari. The Skitari in general, um, normally I would only have ever painted Ultramarines, so this collection of course forced me into painting other Imperial armies and the Skitari in particular are just amazing models. They really are incredible in terms of their detail, in terms of the variety, the kind of the weird Wild West vibe with some of their lever rifles and kind of robotic horses, things like that and the kind of the the robes and the kind of the religious mechanical fervor that they have it's a great army with a great kind of lore and background and i have to say that um it was thanks to this magazine series that i finally started painting them and building them and i think that if i do expand my imperial army beyond ultramarines it'll probably be in the direction of this guitari now that said i also want to make a note of the Sisters of Battle and this many in particular uh, especially as an Irish Catholic you have a kind of a, an inbuilt fear of uh, nuns <laughs> and uh, kind of religious zealotry uh, but um, just this model in particular I remember just the sheer the design of it the the brilliance the the sculpting skill that they were able to sculpt a model that is literally running in perpetual motion running right really forward and still works as a tabletop piece i mean this poor guy is a some sort of guy who's sinned so in order i think he was a heretic and what the sisters do if they show mercy is they'll hook some of the heretics up to these penitent engines and send them off into battle so that they can kind of redeem themselves for the emperor but i remember this particular piece was just it was quite frankly it, it was an amazing thing to build and paint and i just marveled at the design of it um, the sisters of course are stunning stunning models um, but I found them very difficult uh, I think these models deserved a better painter than me but nevertheless they are an incredible army and that uh, I can see why they're so very very popular um, in terms of the Necrons the Necrons are interesting because I never ever would have collected a Necron army except it just it uh, it was part of this magazine um, but now that I have them I'm delighted with them um, some of the design of them like this one in particular now the uh, I love the shields the the magazine comes with alternative builds so on this one in particular they're all supposed to be built with kind of staves like this so I kept I kept the leader as the one holding the actual stave but the shields just looked so cool I could not help myself but actually build them so I built the uh, the minions with the actual shields and I left the leader with the stave but it's not just them my if I had to pick an infantry unit from the Necrons it would be the flayed ones I remember these near the start of the series and they were just great fun to paint like I mean they're hideous they they're they're Necrons that just adorn themselves with the skin of their enemies. Even the other Necrons think they're kind of creepy, but there's a very Edward Scissorhands kind of weird vibe to these things. But um, the flayed ones in particular, I had great fun in painting and just kind of adorning with blood. Um, other Necron aspects, of course, is the spider tank, which just steals the show every time it's on the table. It's just a huge, big, monstrous thing. Um, there is, of course, the Mario Kart buggy, which uh, I know a lot of people mock it, but I love it. I think it's, it's a fast, mobile strike little thing. So, I mean, you know, if, if it looks stupid, uh, but it works, it's not stupid, is the, the mantra I would adopt on that. 
Um, other aspects, of course, would be Gilliman. Never, I think if it wasn't for the Imperium magazine and the kind of the deadline that I kept placing on myself, I don't think I ever would have painted Gilliman. He would have stayed in my stash forever. But uh, thanks to this video series and thanks to yourselves, um, I had no choice but to basically screw my courage to the sticking place and um, paint him. And whilst I have no doubt that there is plenty of other better paint jobs out there, for me, for a man of my ability, I am actually very happy with how he came out. Um, he's a lovely centerpiece to my Ultramarine army and uh, it's great that I can actually field him. So um, again, like I said, if it wasn't for this collection, he probably would have stayed forever in my stash. And one other thing I'd like to point out is just the um, this one. I know it was, it's a weird pose and it's kind of comical that in the middle of a battle with Necrons, uh, with ally, with sister allies and Skitari allies and fellow Ultramarines, out of nowhere a, Necro, uh, a Tyranid comes to attack this <laughs> Redemptor Dreadnought. So I can imagine the Dreadnought is wondering, what the hell is this guy doing here? But I, I'm just kidding aside, it's just having a second Redemptor Dreadnought allowed me to experiment with it a little bit because I have a previous Redemptor Dreadnought from Warhammer Conquest. So um, it just allowed me to kind of try play with poses and things like that and to have a bit of fun in doing something like this. Now, I mean, uh, it's just something I'm quite happy with. It was kind of a happy accident. The way the legs were screwing up and the actual design as well allowed a bit of flexibility. But um, this is one piece I think I'm quite happy to have. This piece alone kind of made the whole magazine series worth the journey for me and of course the last person I want to kind of bring out of course is the Inquisitor Cesaris himself who I think was a lovely mini to um, finish off the entire series with because it just shows the Necrons at their absolute worst where they're just taking some poor Imperial citizen and siphoning the blood and soul out of him and even here it's just his finger is swirling the guy's essence into uh, some sort of magical thing that he can kind of, um, I don't know, use or manipulate or put into a kind of a specific orb. But just a great kind of mini to finish off the entire collection with. So I guess I'm still posed with the same question out of the minis, which are my, which one is my favorite? And I think the honest answer is all of them. I don't think that there's uh, a single thing here that I regretted painting, regretted working on, or regretted kind of assembling because I learned from all of them. Even with ones that I would have done ad nauseum, such as this, it's doing this at a pace every week uh, just allowed me to kind of grow in my hobby and to become better in my hobby. So it might be a bit of a cop-out answer, but my favorite mini genuinely is all of them. So if you're someone who's watched uh, all nine episodes of this and shared the journey with me, all I can say to you is thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for uh, supporting this video series. And uh, thank you for sharing this journey with me because it was quite a fun thing to do. And looking at it, at this body of work I have in front of me, which is the culmination of uh, 90 issues, more than a year and a half's work. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite nice to see. Um, I hope that this video series has basically reinforced your love of this wonderful hobby. And I hope that this video series in some shape or form has inspired you maybe to take up the hobby yourself or even to kind of uh, revisit some old favorites from your stash and maybe one or two occasions put uh, paint to brush and brush to model in your own right. So as always, this is Sean from The Lucky Roll. Uh, if you enjoy these videos, please like, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. Uh, we have a current paint series going on the Warhammer Age of Sigmar. And um, until next time, good luck, God bless, and uh, one last time, praise the Emperor. <laughs>